start this um, session with uh, the introductions, roughly five minutes each, following which we have uh, we open the floor for the discussion. I would like to perhaps start with uh, Commissioner Nils Mujnes. Uh, Nils, you travel a lot uh, around Europe and beyond. Uh, you regularly meet, regularly meet with the human rights defenders. What are the most uh, pressing issues that they bring to your attention? And could you share some examples uh, with us, please? Yes, thank you very much, Yanis. And, and it's a great pleasure to be here and see so many old friends. Um, let me start by talking about the pressing issues I see. And I'm only talking about the Council of Europe 47. So I will not talk about those members of the OSC who are not members of the Council of Europe. Uh, and later, if we have time, I can talk about uh, the Council of Europe's role and how we might work together more effectively. Uh, but let me start with the problems and, and issues that are brought onto my plate uh, by defenders. Um, first of all, I think threats, attacks, uh, judicial harassment, trumped up charges, uh, stigmatizing rhetoric, uh, and defamation campaigns against human rights defenders. Uh, these are some of the main issues. Uh, I think there are certain topics that are more dangerous to be involved in, and there are certain geographical areas where human rights defenders are more vulnerable. Uh, I think the topics here, I will follow on with uh, Mr. Lombardinus talked about the unpopular topics. The unpopular topics in the Council of Europe region are LGBTI issues, uh, Roma issues, uh, migrants and refugees, and issues pertaining to transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict uh, areas. Uh, the geographical areas, I think, where defenders are most vulnerable, uh, one is the North Caucasus. The most regular reports uh, of pressure and threats on defenders working there. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, visited a number of human rights defenders in detention there. And I think uh, you yourself uh, very eloquently told the story of Anar Lamadli, who's a good friend of the Council of Europe as well. Um, I think former Yugoslavia, those dealing with transi transitional justice issues in, in that area uh, are sometimes very vulnerable to various kinds of pressures and threats. And now I think we see that Eastern Ukraine uh, is a danger zone where every day we get reports of abductions, kidnappings, torture, uh, and even summary executions. Um, so I think these are the, the dangerous areas, areas, but there are dangerous topics as well. Uh, one of the, in terms of legislation, uh, I think we see very widespread uh, restrictive legislation uh, in a number of different <coughs> council of Europe uh, countries. Uh, first of all, freedom of expression, criminalization of defamation in many countries still, uh, even though we've been advocating for the decriminalization of defamation for many years. Uh, most recently engaged on this topic in Azerbaijan, but also in Italy. Uh, just two days ago, together with Lina Miatovic of the OSC and Frank LaRue, we published a joint op-ed urging the Italian authorities to decriminalize uh, defamation. Uh, blocking of the internet, not only of ind individual pages, uh, but of whole platforms. Uh, recent, recently engaged in Turkey on the ban of, on the blocking of, of YouTube and Twitter. Uh, and there I, I, I hail and welcome the, the, the judgments of the Constitutional Court. Um, vague anti-terrorism or anti-extremist legislation, but also laws banning so-called propaganda against uh, homosexuality. Those are the key things affecting freedom of expression. Regarding freedom of assembly, uh, police violence during demonstrations uh, is a serious threat in many countries. Uh, a number of recent reports uh, that I've put out have focused on this issue in Ukraine, Turkey, Spain. Uh, harassment of human rights defenders for participating in demonstrations or monitoring them. Uh, bans in specific locations on assemblies. On freedom of assembly, on uh, freedom of association, uh, difficulties in registration or re registration, uh, destruction of, uh, of, of, of property, restrictions on receiving foreign funding, abuse of inspections. Uh, the two big areas where I've worked on this recently is in Russia. We wrote a very long opinion on uh, the Russian foreign agents law and its implementation. Very worrying trends uh, on pressures uh, and recent legislative changes. Uh, in Russia on this, but also in Azerbaijan, recently published an update on the previous report, uh, a number of uh, negative trends regarding uh, 
the work of NGOs there. There are other restrictions as well. Restrictions on visiting certain locations, on leaving the country, uh, surveillance, and so on. Um, but uh, I think I've, I've covered the main problems. And one, one thing that really kind of upsets me that was uh, that creates the atmosphere for such restrictions is negative rhetoric uh, and the negative image that many governments and many media outlets give to human rights defenders. It makes it much easier uh, to impose restrictions. Uh, I think we need to raise awareness about the positive contribution of human rights defenders uh, to counter this negative narrative of the um, foreign agents of traitors of raising unpopular issues and undermine traditional cultures and values. We need to talk much more about how they are the champions of accountability, how they are the ones who call governments to account and force them uh, to account for the way they, they have ruled, the way they have spent money, uh, and they are the ones who give voice to those who do not have a voice, who defend the vulnerable, and so on. I think we need to really change the narrative uh, and I think that's the first step towards combating all of these restrictions, uh, threats and attacks, and, and to mobilizing uh, people in support of, of human rights defenders. And, and we have not been uh, waging that battle successfully enough. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for this uh, quick overview of uh, the environment in which uh, our human rights defenders are working, which in many places, as you, as you depicted, is a uh, pretty hostile one. Uh, this will certainly be a challenge for the newly appointed UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, Michel, would you be able to outline how you plan to approach challenges like uh, new system, please? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Fifteen uh, years ago, I was in, uh, in Paris sitting with uh, Larry Lohler. Uh, we uh, decided to organize the uh, first uh, summit of human rights defenders and we uh, invited in Paris uh, more than uh, 300 defenders coming from uh, 110 countries. And uh, listening to the uh, testimonies uh, of those defenders coming from uh, so many countries, uh, we saw that uh, there would be uh, a lot uh, to, to be sure that uh, they would be uh, protected uh, uh, from uh, uh, harassment from, from states. And uh, since uh, 15 years, there is a lot that has been done uh, at international level and at national level. But nonetheless, we see that uh, uh, what, when we hear defenders uh, and when we hear the testimonies of defenders, we see that uh, the framework is the same. And uh, the testimonies uh, right now are the same that we heard uh, in the past. So that's uh, a very much challenging for, for us, for, for me as the new special reporter and the memoirs defenders. So. Uh, the, um, like my two predecessors uh, in Algeria and uh, Margaret Sakaria, uh, have been able to uh, develop a lot of uh, new uh, tools, uh, the uh, conduct missions in different countries. Uh, and uh, especially uh, Margaret Sakaria has been able to develop uh, a new framework that I would like to encourage all of you, <coughs> ambassadors and uh, representatives of from states, uh, to read uh, uh, this uh, framework. And, try to see uh, how it would be possible for you to implement uh, this framework at national level. The beauty of the mandate is that uh, it is one of the powerful mandates uh, with the UN. Um, Hina, Giovanni and Margaret have been able to uh, explore all the limits of the mandate and it is my intention to uh, go beyond what I have done so far and to also explore uh, the limits of the mandates and to name the countries uh, which I see that, uh, that defenders are uh, harassed or attacked by, uh, by government. The beauty of the mandate is that uh, you've been, I've been appointed for uh, three years uh, by the Council. Uh, I'm well supported by uh, the Office of the High Commissioner, well supported by some of the uh, states, notably uh, Norway, uh, Ireland, uh, the EU as well, and I hope to uh, see other countries uh, supporting this mandate in, in other parts of the world. The beauty of the mandate is that I'm independent from anyone, independent from uh, the governments, independent from the UN, and the possibility to speak to the UN to say what I think uh, of the situation of defenders, also to the UN, to please keep emissions uh, to uh, uh, country, country team. 
The beauty of the mandates is that uh, I am the uh, eyes and the ears of the council. I'm there to listen to what defenders have to say. I'm there to look at the situation and then to report to the council, to report to the UN General Assembly and to make proposals uh, to uh, try to push governments to implement not only the uh, declaration but also uh, the uh, decision that we made in the past uh, on the situation of defenders. I have um, uh, a lot of good tools at my disposal that are really uh, urgent actions and uh, looking uh, in the database of the uh, mandate I see that uh, Many countries uh, of in this region have been the target of uh, urgent actions. Uh, letters of allegations by which I can send letters to the uh, authorities to uh, raise uh, the issue of one or the other defenders. I have the possibility also to conduct country missions, country visits, and then to meet with uh, high level officials, ministers, and other states in the, the regions to raise with them individual situation also a framework. The beauty of the mandate is that uh, I also have the possibility to interact with my colleagues, notably uh, the two other mandates that are relevant uh, to protect defenders, uh, the Special Reporter on Freedom of Speech and the Special Reporter on Freedom of Association. And if you would look at the uh, database uh, of all of us, you would see that 80% uh, of all communications are addressed to the three mandates, uh, and this is why we are developing joint action. The key challenge is ambassador for the uh, coming months and years. Uh, uh, there's a lot, but I would want to mention, only mention uh, four of them. One is the, uh, the gap in terms of implementation. The second one is the uh, issue of reprisals, which is uh, of uh, great importance right now. The third one is uh, the issue of deliberate attacks against uh, specific groups and the fourth is how to better coordinate between uh, regional and international mechanisms to protect uh, defenders. On the first uh, issue, the first challenge, the uh, gap in terms of implementation, I would see that uh, there's a lot of uh, decisions taken, a lot of recommendations addressed to authorities, uh, and uh, you will see that uh, many of them remain uh, without response, without adequate response or appropriate response from governments. Despite the fact that uh, there's a lot of letters, a lot of appeals, a lot of joint communications addressed to the same states, uh, we don't see any reply from the states and that's not acceptable. And we encourage you, all of you, uh, ambassadors, to uh, look at all the communications addressed to you, to all of you, and to uh, better reply to uh, those letters of allegations coming from mandates uh, of the UN. Uh, there is, um, uh, I don't want to mention names, but uh, uh, here in the uh, OSC region, uh, I don't have any, any response from, from, from so many countries uh, that I could uh, uh, list, if I would list the name of the countries you would feel that uh, this one well region that uh, doesn't reply uh, to the communications sent by uh, my office and by uh, my, my colleagues. And this is why it is my, my intention to uh, conduct a study on no lack of implementation, the gap of implementation, in which I will uh, publicly name the countries that don't reply to communications. The idea is not to shame the country, but to name them in order to engage in the discussion with them. The second issue is the question of reprisals, and uh, it's probably uh, that's one of the questions that will be raised in the uh, other panels, and we probably will hear from civil society organizations uh, what uh, they see in the countries. And uh, what I see in the database, the increasing number of uh, police defenders uh, that uh, only for having spoken to the UN, uh, to special rapporteurs, to treaty bodies, uh, to the Commission of the Council of Europe. Uh, they uh, uh, have, uh, they, they receive uh, uh, intimidations, uh, harassment, uh, they are abducted, arrested, uh, they are tortured by, uh, by government 
simply because they have spoken to a colleagues uh, of me. And this is also something that is not acceptable and we need to develop other tools uh, at international level but also at regional level to make sure that uh, uh, those uh, uh, reprisals uh, against defenders uh, don't remain unpunished. <laughs> if you look at uh, other regions, uh, in the case of uh, the African Union, the uh, African Union has decided to uh, give a specific mandate uh, to the Special Rapporteur on the defense of the region to look at the question, at the question of reprisals. And this is one of the issues that could be also discussed with the UN uh, to give uh, to my mandate a specific mandate on the issue of, uh, of defenders. The third ambassador is the uh, deadly attacks on groups facing the terrorists. And here, I will name countries. There's the issue of uh, LGBTIs. And then uh, I have another debate the names of Armenia, Georgia, Russian Federation, Lithuania, Serbia, but also Ukraine. And uh, this is also something that uh, probably I will discuss uh, in my next report uh, the situation of those defenders that are facing risk because only they are trying to uh, defend those who are and <coughs> rights. The issue of uh, migrant rights, and here you have uh, in my database uh, countries like Belgium, like France, like Cyprus, like Greece, like Poland, like uh, again the Russian Federation. And you have the issue of uh, uh, defenders uh, in conflict zones, conflict situation, and then of course you have uh, Ukraine, you have uh, Kyrgyzstan, you have the Russian Federation, and those defenders are particularly vulnerable. Then you have the defenders facing uh, uh, fighting against impunity, and then you have Turkey, Uzbekistan, and other countries in the region. Then you have the uh, trade unionists uh, who are also targeted by, by countries, and uh, in a number of countries, uh, so long that I will not be able to name all the countries uh, that are harassing uh, trade unions. Then you have uh, land and environmental uh, rights uh, defenders. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you have also those who are simply uh, harassed because they receive funding. Uh, and this is something that I also try to uh, uh, raise in my uh, next report. And I'm particularly happy with the last decision taken by the working group on arbitrary de detention on the case of Ales Pilaski that you mentioned this morning. Uh, and uh, especially because the uh, working group uh, has recalled uh, uh, the right to uh, receive funding, including to receive funding from uh, abroad, uh, but also recalls the obligation from states uh, to protect those who receive funding from, uh, from abroad. Last ambassador will be the uh, question of coordination between uh, all the uh, mechanisms. My mechanism is the UN mechanism, but also have contacts with the African Union, uh, with the uh, Americas, in which the, there is a mechanism. And I'm particularly happy to see that uh, in the framework of the uh, OSE region, you have to block these guidelines that could be the first step to uh, uh, maybe uh, develop and then to decide to uh, uh, set up a new mechanism, especially for, for Europe. Better protect uh, defenders together with the Council of Europe and the Commission because uh, uh, this week. So I will stop here for the uh, first part of the discussion. Thank you very much for this um, eloquent uh, articulation of what the challenges are uh, before you. I would like to now ask uh, Mary Lord to share with us on the basis of her long term experience working with human rights defenders, what uh, are the trends in regards to the risks that human rights defenders face? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank you for inviting frontline defenders to participate here today. We are delighted that the OSCE ODIR guidelines are being launched and sincere thanks to all involved, in particular to you, Ambassador, and Archit, and your team 
the Swiss chairmanship, and not forgetting the previous Irish chairmanship and all those who were involved in civil society in the Dublin Declaration. It is all the more fitting uh, because the OSC was the only well-established regional mechanism with a clear human rights mandate which did not have a specific instrument on human rights defenders. The issue of human rights defenders is, as we all know, very relevant for all participating member states. I don't suppose any of us, or many of us here, will understand what it must be like to live with the smell of fear and the uncertainty of life and still continue to work non-violently for the rights of others. It takes a special kind of courage. And to put it in context, while we were very delighted and grateful that a human rights defender was released in Uzbekistan uh, 10 days ago on medical grounds, we remember today Dilmer Saeed, who was sentenced in 2009 to 12 and a half years. He's a member of the Human Rights Society, Esbelik. He defended the rights of farmers in the Samarkand region, whose land had been illegally seized by the local administration, and he works as, a, as an independent journalist for Voices of Freedom. He has tuberculosis. In an appalling tragedy, his wife and his five-year-old only daughter were killed on their way to visit him in a car accident. And I'm afraid the administration would not even allow them to attend their uh, funeral. And just to give you his sense, in his own words, the representatives of legal organs circumvented the law, closed their eyes to justice, protected and continued to protect the interests of those individuals, which essentially are corruption, oppression, injustice, and lawlessness. In the path of the law, it was not only me who became a victim of the courts of justice, but also my family. I have lost the people dear to me and my innocent five-year-old daughter. I have become guilty, though I am blameless. I am not afraid of death. I live awaiting it. I lived, worked, and walked along the path of justice, caring for those around me. In spite of everything, I have always, and will always, will be convinced that my work is right. The situation in many countries in the OSE region has deteriorated in the last couple of years. We have seen the consolidation of negative trends as regards the ability of human rights defenders to operate freely and restrictions on the space for civil society. A number of pieces of legislation have been adopted which have either criminalized groups working on specific human rights issues such as the rights of LGBTI people, <coughs> or have branded them as foreign agents and subjected them to <coughs> intrusive inspections or to legal proceedings. While a lot of attention in relation to this type of legislation is focused on the Russian Federation, laws restricting the operational space for human rights defenders have been or are being discussed in several other countries, including Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan. And legislation, of course, is not the only way of silencing human rights defenders. From January 2013 until now, we have followed the arrest of over 30 human rights defenders in the OSCE region, without counting the many more who have been in detention from previous years. And we followed nearly 20 cases of legal proceedings without counting the Russian Federation where dozens of proceedings have been opened on the basis of the foreign agents' law. Human rights defenders working within member states of the European Union were not immune from challenges. In several countries, right wing <coughs> extremist groups posed threats to human rights defenders, in particular those working on Roma and LGBTI interests. An anti-fascism activist was killed in Greece in September by a member of the extremist party Golden Dawn. In Romania in December, there were reports of excessive use of force by police against local villagers and human rights defenders protesting in relation to environmental and land rights concerns linked to shale gas projects. In the United Kingdom, a human rights defender working on the use of drones as well as the partner of former Guardian journalist Glenn Greenwald, who helped bring to light the US global communication surveillance system, were held for several hours under the Anti-Terrorism Act while transiting through London airports. And in North America, there were reports of police harassment as well as an arson attack against a US-based organization working on sex work, drug policy, and reproductive rights and reports of surveillance on online activities of Canadian human rights defenders who was working on indigenous issues. We've also seen a marked increase in the targeting of human rights defenders working on economic, social, and cultural rights, in particular those working
on issues related to extractive industries, the right to land, clean water and sanitation. In many of those cases, non-state actors such as private security firms and corporations were involved. And this raises the question of the role and responsibility of the countries where the corporations concerned may be based. Finally, I'd like to mention electronic surveillance. Edward Snowden's revelations have drawn public attention to an issue that human rights defenders have long been facing. In the last year, we documented a number of cases of human rights defenders having their web 